Hi everyone. Well, another gun video. Look, this one I'm gonna focus on just some really practical techniques and tips for shooting in the bush because a lot of those techniques aren't spoken about a lot because if you come from the discipline of target shooting or something like that, you can get some very specific techniques which, yes, are great for accurately shooting a rifle but not necessarily in a very practical situation when you wanna get some success on the ground in a whole variance of situations. First things first, I'm gonna do a little bit of housekeeping and then we'll get into the video. Cool, I've had a few people asking why I haven't been answering comments or getting onto messages. Guys, I don't have any internet or service on my new place. And that's been tricky, and I'm working very hard to fix that up, but regional areas have problems with, well, the price and the logistics of making that happen. It's gonna happen. Secondly, the videos are slowing down just a little bit, and that's because I've started a new job. I've got a six month contract to do some fire tail work for forestry over summertime, which I'm really looking forward to, and it's been a great start. Um, but yeah, look, new jobs say, take precedence sometimes and I've just got to do my best at that. Because I'm working an intensive summer job, that's giving me the chance to have a really, really, really big season next year. Life gets real, I've got to pay for stuff, so that's that one. Rightio, so there'll be a lot of talking in this video and a bit of demonstration, but for those demonstrations, I've got an unloaded rifle. I'll check that a few times now. I want to emphasize that there's no ammunition involved in this demonstration or this video at all. And there's also no other people around, so if I'm doing a whole bunch of these ones, people want to have a crack at me about safety, it's been checked, and it's all good. Anyway, so here I am, Remington 700, 7mm 08 rifle. There's another video about that which you can look at beforehand, why I chose the rifle in particular, and a bit of advice and that kind of stuff. Let's get past the caliber questions, please. People get very, very hung up on the gun and people like to have the sexiest bit of kit, and that's not wrong. I would love to have an arsenal, I just can't afford one. What is a rifle worth, unless you know how to use it properly and well? Buying a 300 Win Mag instead of a 243 is not gonna get you greater success on animals. Let's talk about ways that we can get consistent results out of your tool. So first question I have to ask myself is, you know, being a good hunter equated with being a good shot. You think, well, cool, what, what, what makes a good shot? Some of the best shots in the world, people who do competitive target shooting, they're not in the same position and they're not in the same place. Like, if I ask myself, am I a good shot? Not really. No, no, I'm not. Um, I'd like to think I'm consistent. If anyone watched my pine video, they saw I had to put two bullets in a deer because I stuffed up. I mean, you learn, you move on, whatever. The point I'm trying to make is that Every single situation that you're going to be shooting at a deer or a game animal in is going to be different. And having some basic muscle memories and habits developed that are going to help you address every situation with some sense of equality, that's what you're after. I think, well, go back to the range property, fix it there. That doesn't help us either. And the problem is, uh, I'm going to get political, whingy, whatever, but like, shooting off the bench, what do you learn? Like seriously, like you, you don't, you don't learn. It's not applicable to field um, situations. I, all, all the ranges that I'd ever use and have accessed are in and around Sydney. So I know that some country ranges are different, have more relaxed rules. We know it's not, the rules aren't becoming more relaxed, it's becoming more that way. That's, that's, that's an issue. One thing I've often done is I drive fire and practice at home. I don't care how much of a wank you think it is, but you know, as a young guy and I was keen on guns and finally got my hands on one, I was spending a lot of time at home, like just dry firing, which is not great for your gun all the time, but things like that, just to, just to get the habits going and going ready. I wanna show you a few of these basic habits that I want, like especially young guys to hear, because I think this is what's gonna help, just these basic habits, if you get it from the very beginning, it's just gonna have a flow on effect through your whole hunting career, lifetime, lifespan, whatever. Here they are. So one thing I want to cover first is how you're actually carrying your rifle. Of course, I mean, it is possible just to carry it around all day, but you know, any hunter who's had any experience in the field is going to have a sling. I mean, it's pretty common sense. I have chosen a safari sling. It's not a perfect system, but I have found it very, very useful for stalking in the bush. Now the reason, amongst other things, is well, open hands, that's really handy. That is really, no pun intended. One of the main things is when you are in the last moments of a stalk on an animal, it's the stuff around that gets you. 
alerting the animal whilst you're trying to get yourself ready. Now, one message I'm gonna keep pushing throughout this whole video is to keep things basic and simple so that there's no fuck around factor. We don't want to fuck around because then they fuck off. Starting here. It's, it's narrowing my, my profile amongst other things as well. It's like, I'm not having, like reaching out for a rifle over my shoulder or doing any side movements like this. It's all centralized. Up in one. When I'm carrying this, I, and this is like in the last moments of a stalk, I've got a round in the chamber. And I've got my bolt up. So I've put the round in, and my safety catch is the bolt up. That's my choice. I want to emphasize that safety is everyone's individual responsibility. Yeah, there is such thing as a safety catch. There's a reason why there's no safety courses, firearm safety courses in Australia that preach the use of it. It's because it's not safe. It's not. If you choose to use it, and I'm going to admit that there are times, very occasionally, like in the last 30 seconds of a Samba stalk where I have had my safety catch on. That's bolt down, safety catch on, so that it minimizes, so it's just a quiet flick off. But even then it makes some noise. It's not safe. I'll have it up like this, and if I see an animal, gently push down there, or lift it up, or bring it up to the eye, and then down there. These are my rifle now rigged up with a traditional sling. This is Tristan's. I don't know if he knows I have it, but thanks, brother. Um, yeah, cool. So this is what I think 90% like of rifles and firearms would have on them, or the sling them. I'm not saying that having a rifle like this, which is pretty normal, is wrong. It's not wrong. But I am saying that if you're in the last minutes of a stalk and you know you're reacting to an animal that's just there, doing this one is movement. And I'll see movement pretty easily. Get off. So let's just like again, not wrong to have this, but just say you are in the last minutes of a stalk. I advocate doing it this way. So it's having it like straight on like this. And again, it's quite comfortable. You can't just like run around all day without it maybe coming off eventually. But hold it firmly like this, right at the front. So there you are in the last moments. Walking forward. You spot it. You suss it out. You identify it. One of those ones. I find that really, really useful and very helpful. But let's, let's look at the fundamental cause of why shots might fluff up. As in like why, why a poor shot might happen. 90% of the time, shaky hands. Like seriously, it's, it's, I mean, that seems like such an obvious thing to say. And you think, well, what's the worst shooting position you could then take in order to knock down an animal that's gonna be like the least supported, um, where the shaking factor is the most, the hardest to get a proper shot on. It's probably the old offhand, off the knees anyway, but like that. So does that mean it's wrong to shoot offhand? No, I reckon more than half the animals that I've taken in my life have been offhand. Tricky shots. Ways of managing that, though, there's plenty of ways. I mean, the obvious way is to find some kind of makeshift rest. I'll go into that next, but let's look at some ways that we can do it straight away. Cool. Offhand shots. Got an animal in my sights. Oh, and it's moving around a little bit. Obviously, the further away it is, the more the wobble factor affects it. Yes, that's a tricky one, but what's completely different to that is because the reason why there's a wobble factor is because that front arm is trying to stay stationary and it's trying to hold a weight at the same time. So, I'm trying to make it all happen, tensing different muscles, that's where the shake comes from. It's a whole different thing when you pick up an animal and you start to trace it and move it. Taking a moving shot offhand, completely different and you will find that you'll probably get better accuracy. You can't take a moving shot from a rested position that easily let alone from a prone lying down or anything like that. I mean, so I'm saying offhand shots aren't a poor shot to take. Let's just find ways to manage them. So the moving shot, all good. Just say it is stationary. Having a sling, and this is where a traditional sling really does come to benefit. One arm through there. So it's tensed on the, on the back of your, just below your shoulder, on the back of your tricep muscle there. This arm comes in underneath. All of a sudden, we've got a really, really, really strong system. Like I'm not even holding this now, but 
in fact, I'm not even gripping with my front hand. It's a third anchor point right there. It's taken the wobbles off. No, I shouldn't cheat, I'm leaning on my knee there, but come back. But all of a sudden, it's braced against my whole body and I can relax my front hand more. And that's really important because the grip is also the form of tensing muscles that creates a shake. As soon as you stop having to grip and you can just like relax your hand, it's amazing. Try that trick if you haven't already. Now, you can do that with the Safari Sling too. Um, you just need it a little bit tighter at times and you might need to play around with it a bit. Different body shapes, types, all that kind of thing. So just in relation to moving shots, we're always talking about small windows of time that are kind of critical for your success. There should be only two things that you're going through your mind when that happens. Two questions you need to ask. First, is it, is it a game animal? Is it something that I want to kill? That's a positively identifying your target. That's what that is. And the second question is, what's behind it? Those are the only two things you have time to think about. And they're the only two things that you must have time to think about. Let's never be loose on safety there. But also, that's about success as well. So, cool. Tracing an animal. Wow. It's a red deer. Red stag, my dreams. What's behind it? Cool. It's not skylined. It's on the rocks. Bang. So, hypocrite alarm going off for a second here. But one really good habit to develop is keeping both eyes open, even when you're shooting. So, the idea is you don't ever want to be taking your vision off, off game. I mean, I can think of a few painful instances where I saw a pretty damn good animal that I wanted and then even just a few seconds of looking elsewhere, look back up again, gone. You don't know where it's headed. It was just, and then it's gone. It disappears on you. So, when you see an animal that you want to shoot, boom, both eyes open. And here's the second thing. You want to bring the rifle up to your eyes. You're not trying to get yourself down behind your rifle. You're looking, the gun just comes up to your eyes and what's going on here? Keeps coming up that way. Try and develop that habit. You will lose less animals. The reason for keeping both eyes open is there's better depth perception but also a better sense of what's going on around. Like, just say you might have noticed one pig and it's so easy to get tunnel vision and you focus on that and you're like, oh, what if you got I don't know, another 20 different pigs in amongst a bunch of lamandra bushes or low scrubs, something like that. Um, when you're only dealing with one eye or you're tunneling in, that's when you're going to start just losing sense of what's around you. Think of other times where, you know, you might see a high end or something and you think, oh, that's good, I want that. But if you're so tunneled in on that one thing and you'd miss that there's a stag that's further up above you, perception of what's going on around you, perception of depth, it's important. If you can build those habits, that'll really help. Cool. I just want to talk about improvising rests for a second. Now, one of the most common, easily accessible rests that you're going to get in a forest is just a tree. A thin and narrow tree is often better. I get my hand open like that. And I place it straight on the tree. Put my rifle in there on my thumb. Now, one of the reasons why this is the better way of doing it is because you know, the tree goes straight up and down, you can adjust your hand at any height. If you use a straight across log, which can like could be an absolute godsend if you need a long range shot and you've got this perfect flat rest, but you can't move that up and down. There you are moving your body up and in and around it to try and, you know, use your using that log as an anchor point. You don't want that to be the anchor point, you want your hand to be the anchor point. So straight across like this, as far to the front of the rifle as is reasonable. And that is just so steady. Bang. Bang. Awesome. Bit lower down. Easily fixed. Bit higher up on the hill. Easily fixed. Bob's your uncle. So if you are presented with a big fallen tree or a log or a cross branch that gives you the perfect rifle rest and you've got a longer range shot to take, well cool. Of course you're going to use it. One thing to be careful of here too though is brittle hard surface. Now, when I was going off the tree before, off the hand, nicely resting between my thumb and my feet, like that's soft, right? Nice soft rest. You do want something that's not brittle. Because if it's brittle, the way the rifle recoils can, it, it just creates a whole bunch of variables. And of course, at longer range, those variables show up, show up and can really stuff up your hunt, right? So if you are, you know, got a cross branch like this, don't just place the rifle on it and go from it. What I would do, 
is jumper, jacket, beanie, something soft, just something to put underneath that rest there, and that'll absorb. The thing is, if you do any bench rest shooting or you go to the range and sight in your rifle, and you do notice the difference between a soft rest or a hard rest or something like that, you, the difference will show up. Especially if you bipod straight onto a hard surface, that'll show up. So a nice soft rest like this, bang. Oof. Cool. So just say you find yourself in that, you know, hunter's dream scenario of big wide open expanses and you know, there's a lot of people here who would hunt pasture land and open paddocks and stuff like that and think, cool, well, that's a territory for a bipod. It's probably gonna finally advocate a bipod. Here's the thing. So many times when I've been in that situation to go off the prone, which is probably the most stable shooting position you can possibly adopt, you might look out there and think, oh wow, it's just so flat and open. But the grass is still going to be knee high and you'll be buried in it. And so just say it's not knee high, it's down to lower level. You're limiting yourself. The chances, the 90% of the time, you're going to find yourself somewhat buried in thistles and grass. And that's just why I just don't... Sure, if you've got the perfect prone position to take, go for it. So often I've found myself where it just doesn't eventuate that way. And if you're planning for it to be that way, it's not going to be that way. Off the pack though, that can be really good. So just say you are in Vic High Country and you know, you've got a nice, beautiful open expanse. You're probably backpacking in because you kind of need to in those kind of territories. Top of your backpack, that offers that softness that I was just talking about with the beanie. Nice rest. Forget bringing your bipod, just chuck this down on the ground and go for it from there. So again, situation where the thistles and the bracken or the tussock grass is just too high for a flat prone position. Straight up like this, because if you've got a pack and it's an any decent pack, it's going to have a good pack frame, which is just a solid two foot high support like that. You can sit down like this, squat or kneel, and that's just perfect. With both eyes open, of course. Yeah, I've got a terrible habit. So just say it's just hunter and rifle. No packs, no extras, and or no time to take off your pack and muck around or create or just run to trees or anything like that. Sitting down, both knees. This is combining with that um, offhand technique I was showing you before. Strong sling there. One on each knee like that. That's a great position. And you can just tuck your knees up if you need to get more height onto it. Down a little bit if you need a bit lower. You can put one knee to the side like this. And that's like putting your entire lower arm on your knee like that. Extremely solid rest. I think it's important to mention that there is um, one basic skill which does apply to all shooting disciplines. Um, it's breathing. And it's, I just thought to myself, well, I'm doing one specifically, a video specifically on practical shooting, but there's a lot of people who might have not had any shooting coaching at all, but just got their gun license and all that. Guys, controlling your breathing and integrating that into the shot, it's so fundamental. So, that's my old comfy position. As soon as you address your target, cool, there's my deer, having a look at it. Half the reason for controlling your breathing or making sure that you are breathing because if you're so narrowed in or something You can kind of hold your breath you, go, uh, 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 you know and if you're not breathing you're not getting oxygen in if you're not getting enough oxygen in your vision is going to get blurry But that being said like if I was shooting targets and I might even take a Couple of shots a couple of breaths in Before I take my shot and notice every time you breathe in the barrel goes down breathe out barrel comes up again and so you need to anticipate that I think I normally have time for maybe one decent breath before I shoot and what will often be and I'll see if I can get some vision behind the scope is breathe in start breathing out until my crosshairs bang and like you know you don't st like let it rest on the target for a bit and go okay is that good you go mid movement bang so as soon as it's, it comes up level to that point that you want to hit, you don't wait for the shot, you squeeze off as soon as it's bang just behind the shoulder or wherever you intend to hit. Another thing when hunting the scrub is to make sure that you've got your rifle on the lowest magnification possible. Because if you've got a longer range shot come up, 
you can always just wind it up because it gets, if it's a longer range and the animal's further away, there's a chance that it's not been spooked or it's still sussing you out. The further away the game is, the more of a chance you've got and the, a little bit more time for stuffing around if you have to. So if you have it on full, mag, full magnification like this and you get completely lost in your scope because it's just like putting your head on a microscope that's not focused or something like that, that's going to do you no favours and you'll lose animals. Well guys, ah, it's starting to rain. So that's the end of this one. Look guys, I hope that's been helpful to some of you. I know I ramble a bit, that's just my habit, but with any luck, there's some tips there and some good habits that can be developed by new shooters. Anyway, good times are natural guys. Catch ya.